it is once again time. So, for the first time ever, I'm trying my feet out at this podcast thing, but YouTube will still get my pay-per-view and raw review However, it will be the same thing, so I don't know why you would listen to both. But hey, check out my podcast anyway, because there will be a lot of cool stuff in there along with the TLC and the Raw Review. It's going to be called The Other Show with the other guys, so Google that on iTunes. Well, don't Google that. Search that on iTunes. And um, uh, I'm going to be talking about sports, movies, uh, all that good stuff. You know, basically stuff I'm into, basically stuff you would hear on any regular podcast, like I'll probably be telling stories about my life if it's a slow week in sports or stuff like that. So it'll be fun. So as I'm sure none of you have noticed, uh, MT Ho has been missing over the past few weeks, even though he promised uh, channel updates. Um, for those, for the two of you that are probably wondering where he is, um, he has been going through a tough time. And he hasn't had internet since heck in a cell, so he hasn't really been able to get all of our stuff out there. But, you know, he's just been missing, but he's finally getting back up on his own two feet. I think he'll be back relatively soon. And um, hopefully uh, we're going to be doing our podcast thing. I don't know. It's not 100% sure that we're gonna, that I'm going to do it on my own yet. It could be a joint production. Uh, the, the, the works are still being determined right now. TLC 2015 review. Let's get this underway, shall we? All right. We started things off with a tag team triple threat match playa. It was the New Day versus the Usos versus the Lucha Dragons. Now, this match is getting hyped up over the internet as one of the greatest tag team ladder matches of all time. And you know what? In one of the very rare and few times in the history of my time in the IWC, I will agree with the internet because this match was phenomenal. It was fun. It was it was it, there was a lot of cool spots that hadn't been done before. There was Xavier Woods on commentary owning Michael Cole, JBL and the King which is rarely done. Xavier Woods, my hat is off to you, my friend. Great work. And just an all-around, just a damn good match. There's not much you can say. Believe it or not, it's funny to think that in 2015, right now, after all these years that the tag team division has been in the shitter, that now the tag team division is probably the best division in the WWE. So that's pretty much all I have to say. An overall fun match. Great stuff out there from all three of these guys. Ryback versus Rusev in basically the epitome of what's been wrong with the WWE as of late. A thrown together random feud that makes no sense with no backstory, with no one caring, with the fans being dead the entire time. Now I personally... Do not dislike either of these guys. I actually like Ryback. And over the past few months, Rusev has grown on me. But, damn it, if you, don't, if you didn't watch this match, what the hell did you actually miss besides Lana looking hot? Because, quite frankly, that was all I was looking at the entire match was Lana looking hot. The match itself was boring. It was uninspiring. It was totally just dragging on. It was... It was, I think, 7 to 10 minutes of just, God, would this end already? Fuck, this is so stupid and pointless. And it's not it's not a knock on Ryback. It's not a knock on Rusev. It's more of a knock on creative for actually thinking we would care about this. Anyway, so what I find pretty funny while I'm on this, and I guess there's not really much else to talk about match-wise, about Rusev... Uh, character ever since Lana came back it seems like he's like more he's kissing her all the fucking time like every time he gets a chance like I don't know if you guys noticed also during the show he like kind of went in for a kiss and Lana didn't really want to kiss him I'm guessing that either he smelled bad or he had like bewing up like loogies in his mouth but um 
I don't know. It just seems like he's a lot more protective of Lana, not just kayfabe wise, but it just seems like he really wants people to know Lana's mine in real life. Not you, not you. She mine. Just kind of wanted to throw that out there. Anyway, um, the next match I believe was Alberto Del Rio versus Jack Swagger in another one. This is this is one that bothers me even more than Ryback versus Rusev because. Although this one made some sense, it was random to see Jack Swagger back on TV after like dying for six months. It's almost like it's almost like us in our channel whenever we just don't do a video. It's kind of like this video itself, actually. I haven't done a video since SummerSlam, and all of a sudden I've returned. That's exactly what Jack Swagger was in this feud. He, he, he's no better than Brock Lesnar, ladies and gentlemen. I'll just leave it at that. Anyway, um, again, this is one where I had the problem the most with, first of all, Del Rio should have never been paired with Zeb Coulter to begin with because that made absolutely no sense to begin with. That was stupid. They had no on-screen chemistry. Their gimmick was stupid, and it was just a cheap way to try and get the Alberto Del Rio heat. Like, for fuck's sake, just let Alberto Del Rio be his own guy. You know, don't bring back Zeb Coulter, who could easily elevate the career of someone like Jack Swagger and, and pair him with someone like Alberto Del Rio, who's not going to get heat no matter what we do to him. And I love Alberto Del Rio, but the only person that he worked well with was exactly Ricardo Rodriguez. Ricardo Rodriguez is pretty much, I think, the only person that that could help Alberto Del Rio get over. Anyway, this match was uh, it wasn't nearly as boring as the Ryback and Rusev match because it was at least I think it was a chairs match and there was at least weapons being used in this match. So there was that, but overall it was just and then and then another problem with this feud before I finish talking about the match was Zeb Coulter was dragged away from Del Rio halfway through this feud, which is the whole reason they started feuding in the first place, because Alberto Del Rio joined the League of Nations. All right? So that's just... all. That's just This screams Vince Russo right here, all over the place. All over the place, it's been screaming Vince Russo. So this just... I don't know. I thought it was dumb. And anyway, this is just like complete filler, boring, and I hate to say this, but if... John Cena comes back and wins the United States Championship. I don't think I would be very upset. The next match was the Wyatt Family versus the Dudley Boys. All right. Um, here's one thing I can say about this. The, 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 this is what I can say about the Wyatt Family. They have at least been booked to an, to, to, to a, an extent where you can kind of excuse them for not having anything to do because they've been booked somewhat strongly. The problem with the Wyatt family right now is that there's nothing for them to do anymore, really. They feuded with The Shield. They feuded with Cena. They feuded with Brian. They feuded with Punk. They feuded with um, Roman Reigns. They feuded with a lot of people, and it's to a point where... Maybe the only way to freshen them up is to turn them face. The thing with that is, I can only see Bray Wyatt being a good face. As for the rest of the family, not so much. So it's it's kind of weird. It's kind of like, I don't know. It's hard to say with the Wyatt family because they're not being booked weekly anymore. But they're just, they're just kind of there on Raw now. It's kind of like, oh... Well, all of Bray Wyatt's feuds start with, hey, I'm coming for you. Ooh, run. So it's just, it's weird. It's, it's, we're at a stalemate with the Wyatt family. They're kind of stale at this point. But um, this match with the Dudleys, I thought, was a good way to get them over, kind of build their credibility somewhat. There's still uh, a long ways to go from me actually believing that they can beat someone uh, huge, like, say, the Brothers of Destruction, who they jobbed out to last month at Survivor Series. Justifiably so, by the way. And, yeah, this match was not good uh, by any stretch of the imagination, at least for me. I thought it was a clusterfuck. I thought it was, like, really just too much stuff going on at once, and it just wasn't 
nearly as good as the match that they had on Raw. And that's pretty much that. As for the Dudleys, my hat's off to the Dudley boys for actually putting teams over since they've returned. Ever since they returned. You know, Tommy Dreamer and Rhino have always been jobbers in the WWE, so there's nothing to credit them for. But the Dudley boys, my hat's off to you guys. Thank you for, since coming back, putting over two very good, solid factions. All right, the next match was Kevin Ambrose versus Dean Owens. So this one was kind of an out-of-left-field type of thing. Now, the match itself actually made sense since there was a number one contenders match beforehand. They built up to it in a decent fashion up until the last week, which was uh, just, again, kitty humor, which is one of the main things that people had a problem with Ambrose right now is his PG booking. Uh, the match itself was pretty good. I wouldn't say it was anything special. It wasn't nearly as good as the, the match they had at Survivor Series, in my opinion. Um, the finish was kind of like... It was really weird because you had Kevin Owens go for the pop-up powerbomb. Ambrose counters it with the slowest-looking Huron Kenrana I've seen in my life. And he rolls him up for the pin. And it was just like an it kind of it was kind of it was a it was a good finish believe it or not because the whole crowd popped the shit out of it. It was just a thing where it was like that kind of came out of left field. Uh, uh, they didn't give Ambrose a whole lot of momentum, but then again, they didn't give Owens that much momentum either. So either way, I guess it was nice to see Dean Ambrose win a championship after a year of almost having it, even having the WWE Championship at one point for about 30 seconds, and it culminates in a championship win. The unfortunate thing for Ambrose fans is that the Intercontinental Championship is cursed. It's a tried and proven formula. Whoever wins the championship is cursed. So, Paige versus Charlotte. I'm going to get into Charlotte's kind of uh, uh, character development on the Raw review. I'll just talk about this match. Why are we giving Paige a million shots at the championship? Is she really the only diva we can give championship matches to? I mean, this is getting to a point where, dare I say it, she's becoming the John Cena of the Divas division. And it's not, it's not by any stretch of the imagination a stretch. Because... She has been in damn near every single Divas Championship match this year. And I want to say about 80 to 90% of them made no sense to have her inclusion. I mean, it's to a point where they even turn her to, to basically leech off of the champion like earlier in the year when Nikki Bella was champion, we didn't know if she was a heel or a face. But when she was a heel, Paige would be the face. When Nikki was a face, Paige would be the heel. And then they decided to, they decided to give the belt to Charlotte. Charlotte's a baby face. Okay, that's all good and dandy. We'll just turn Paige heel again. It's just ridiculous. And this is this is the way that they keep finding excuses to keep giving Paige championship matches. I don't even hate Paige nearly as much as MTO does, but this is ridiculous. Anyway, the match itself, didn't like it, didn't think it was very good. I thought the finish was fun, but again, that adds into Charlotte's character. That ties into Charlotte's character development, which I will talk about on Raw since it had to do more with Becky Lynch. Charlotte retains the championship. Hip, hip, hooray. You know, it's like, okay. A lot of people are complaining about the Divas division right now and saying that it's uninteresting and it's boring. And I think that has a lot to do with their favorite, their darling, Charlotte being the champion. And I think, uh, believe it or not, the absence of Nikki Bella is actually playing a toll because... Even though Nikki Bella's act got a little bit stale, at least for me, toward the end of her championship run, um, she is at least the like only credible diva left. You know, you could say Paige is somewhat credible, but since she's had so many damn chances at the belt and she's lost like damn near every single one of them, how credible is she really? 
And then you have a bunch of people like recent call-ups like Becky Lynch and Sasha Banks who haven't really established themselves on the main roster. Becky Lynch is a jobber. Naomi has been up and down. Her booking has been inconsistent. One week she's like, uh, we show her athleticism. We put over her athleticism on commentary. And then the next week she's a jobber. Tamina just sucks. And it's just, uh, it's it's a headache. You know, Alicia Fox is a jobber. They've made Brie a jobber over the past year. So it's just uh, all over the place. It's a headache. But uh, this is what we wanted, guys. Charlotte is your Divas champion. So I'm glad you guys got what you wanted. Now, if only I could get what I wanted. Which is an interesting Divas division. The main event, Roman Reigns versus Sheamus. That clap was not only for the match, which was a lot better than the fans made it seem. Which, by the way, those We Want Cena, Cena Sucks chants were hilarious. Even though I was irritated by them, I laughed. I thought they were pretty damn funny. But I hope you guys know what you did by chanting that, by the way. You sealed your own fate. John Cena's winning the Royal Rumble, and he's going to face Roman Reigns at Mania for the belt. I hope you know what you did. You sealed your own fate. But anyway, on at the match. I thought the match was a lot better than uh, perceived. At first, yes, the spots were pretty stupid. Like, there was there was some weird stuff. Like, Roman Reigns just casually threw Sheamus somewhere, and Sheamus had to sell it like he kind of, uh, like he died or something, even though he just kind of threw him to the floor. There was one, there was one spot where uh, Roman Reigns was put through two tables, which isn't nearly as awesome as it sounds because he was put through one table individually with a weak maneuver. And I know the second table was broken with a back body drop, which is another weak maneuver to break a table on. So it was pretty damn weird. But um, anyway, towards the end of the match, the League of Nations interferes. And then uh, Roman Reigns, they cost Roman Reigns the match pretty much. And people are getting upset that, you know, Roman Reigns is just beating up the League of Nations like they're nothing. But you think about who the uh, guys in League of Nations are as much as I love Wade Barrett, who got kicked out for no reason. He got ousted. I mean, is I'm I'm wondering if this is what Michael Tarver felt like when Wade Barrett kicked him out of the Nexus, but I digress. Anyway, um, rumor is that he's injured. I'm not buying it until I see him in a cast or in a hospital bed. I'm not buying it. Anyway, uh, you look at the League of Nations. Alberto Del Rio and Rusev have been jobbers uh, for the good part of recent memory. Alberto Del Rio just recently started getting pushed. Even then, like all he did was beat John Cena, which is a big feat. But it is a big feat. Don't get me wrong, but you know he's been treated like a jobber no matter what. And it's it's kind of sad that there's still some of the strongest booked wrestlers on the roster. But one thing I can give creative is that they're starting to get it right. And it started with this. Okay, after Roman Reigns kind of uh, ousted them. It was an awkward finish where Sheamus just grabbed the belt, which, you know, I didn't have as much of a problem with as everyone else because you always wonder why, why when it, in, in a ladder match, why they don't just fucking grab the championship like Sheamus did. But, I uh, again, going to the finish of the match, finally, finally, they booked Roman Reigns in a smart fashion because nobody wants to see the... I'm going to get up and smile, and I'm going to be the nice guy that I've always been. Nobody wants to see that. That is the exact mistake that you're making with John Cena. It was the mistake you were making with Roman Reigns, and it was finally fixed tonight. Because after the match, Roman Reigns attacks the League of Nations, and he goes absolutely bananas on Triple H. One thing that it is being overrated is that people are saying this is like one of the greatest attacks in history. Eh... I mean, you could say that just because of the after effects, but the actual attack wasn't all that special. All he did was break the table. He did hit the nicest, the the most vicious spear I think I've seen in my life before on Triple H, but that's about it. Anyway, um, and then the crowd starts chanting, thank you, Roman. And at first I was like, okay, maybe they're just chanting that just because, you know, they're trying to keep kayfabe or something like that and i read on bleacher report they're like oh this is the beginning 
of the time when people, the internet starts loving Roman Reigns. And I did not believe it until I watched. I did not believe that until I, until I watched Raw and I saw the, the backlash from Raw and TLC. So you know what? To wrap up the TLC review, TLC was, although I did uh, complain a lot about it, uh, overall, I thought it was a good show, one of the better pay-per-views of 2015, but that'll tell you how uh, bad 2015 has been, that TLC, a show that was a, the, had a lot of jobber matches, but was booked really well, is going down as one of the better pay-per-views of 2015. So I think when we look back, this might go down like uh, Money in the Bank 2011 or Payback 2013 where it was the beginning of a new era. Where it was like a thing where we finally get decent booking after we had to suffer through such a shit era. You think about 2013 Payback where before that we had fucking Cena versus Rock 2 which is one of the worst main events in Mania history. And you think before Money in the Bank 2011, where we had WrestleMania 27, which is one of the worst manias in history. So that's about that for this show. Anyway, um, let's just head into the Monday Night Raw review. Just in case you didn't want to hear the TLC review, I gave you the skip option. Monday Night Raw, December 14th, 2015. Wow. Wow. And unlike TLC, that wow doesn't just come from one portion of the show. Even though TLC was booked about as well as it could have been booked, it was still it still felt like a jobber show. Monday Night Raw had a pay-per-view feel to it. Dare I say Raw from December 14th, 2015 is the best pay-per-view of the year aside from WrestleMania. We kicked it off with Stephanie McMahon coming out, cutting her uh, usual promo, angry about Triple H getting attacked. And one thing that you cannot credit Stephanie McMahon enough for, ever I think, is her delivery in her promos. It always comes across as believable. It always comes across as really well because she, her tones, her vocal variety, all that good stuff. If you ever taken a communications class... You would know just how good Stephanie McMahon is as a character and as a mic worker. So she calls out Roman Reigns. Roman Reigns does his usual thing where uh, he kind of like laughs around, jokes around, and then he calls the McMahon family a disgrace. This had the big fight feel to it that we have been missing over the past few uh, weeks. And in fact, like over the past year. Because we haven't had like a big fight feel type of segment on Raw in I don't know how long. So towards the end of the Stephanie McMahon segment, we find out that Vince McMahon is going to be here tonight. One thing I find funny is that these guys, the internet just, this is, I, I consider Philadelphia an internet crowd. You wouldn't know why. The internet just seems to hate Vince McMahon. They're like, oh, he's so out of touch. He needs to die already. He needs to retire. Yeah, we find out Vince McMahon's going to be on TV. What what happens? All you all you guys are like, oh, my God, Vince McMahon's going to be on TV. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. I marked out myself, but you know what? I never claimed to hate Vince McMahon. I don't say that Vince McMahon should retire. I've, I'm not on here bashing Vince McMahon daily. So, anyway... Uh, that was that created an exciting atmosphere for the rest of the night, and um, the first match of the night was Dean Ambrose versus Dolph Ziggler. This was well done because for two baby faces to go at it, I would I didn't expect um, really Ziggler to win. I don't think anybody did. I thought. Ambrose would go over clean and something would happen with Kevin Owens. But no, Kevin Owens came out in the middle of the match, which was a little bit surprising. It was interesting. And he gave him he gave Ambrose and he threw Ziggler out of the ring. He gave Ambrose the pop up power bomb. One thing that I think would have been awesome to see was uh, if anyone remembers Kevin Owens debut when he gave the power power bomb to Sami Zayn on the barricade or on the turnbuckles. What was it? I think it was on the. 
on the side of the ring, whatever, wherever it was. Uh, I think that would have added a lot more to it. Uh, hurt Ambrose a little more. Have him, you know, be a little have him have him have a mountain to climb because give give Owens a little bit of an edge because of all the indie guys that the internet just can't get enough of and masturbate to. Kevin Owens is one of the guys I can actually see why they like him because he's not bad on the mic. He's really good in the ring, and yeah. So I think an Ambrose versus Owens feud is pretty pretty good for the Intercontinental Championship for the time being. So the next match was the return of two superstars, one of which we could deal without unless he's the crazy heel from 2011. The other one, I don't understand what the hell took him so long to bring him back to TV. The guy's hilarious. R-Truth took on Bo Dallas. And um, just like I'm sure everyone drew it up on the chalkboard, this came out to a no finish because Vince McMahon came out halfway through. Now, I have no problem with him coming out in this match. These guys are two bona fide jobbers. I don't think either of them has won a match in 2015. Uh, actually, that's wrong. Our truth beat King Barrett. Never mind. <sighs> But Vince McMahon came out, and he called out Roman Reigns. And this was a thing where it was pretty good. It was pretty cool to see because rarely these days do we get a match interrupted like this in a way where something else is more important, and we have to literally stop the match to make way for this. Um, I'm not saying they should do it every week, but it's just a nice thing to see that they got a little bit more creative with it instead of just having Vince McMahon come out. Anyway, then Vince McMahon threatens to fight Roman Reigns. You know, uh, you know, I'm, you, you know what? I'm surprised Vince McMahon didn't pull his ACLs again like he did in the Royal Rumble 2005. Let alone he's challenging Roman Reigns to a fight. I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, but didn't he break both ACLs or tear both ACLs by just taking off his jacket? Just like uh, Sammy, Sammy Zayn popped out his shoulder by dancing too hard. So it's it was pretty funny. Like that was that was a funny thing to see that Vince McMahon still thinks he can kick somebody's ass. It's kind of cute. No homo. But um, I think uh, we all got a kick out of that one. Anyway, basically this sets up. This is what's weird. All of a sudden Sheamus becomes this brave champion that wants to prove his worth to Vince McMahon that will even put his belt on the line. That I thought was weird. It was uh, kind of out of left field. And a lot of people predicted that uh, Sheamus would walk out in a screw job type of finish the champion. And, you know, Roman Reigns would get storyline fired. And this is one thing that I said uh, during this after the TLC attack. This is one thing that I was thinking is like one thing that that the roster being so thin right now, it, it'll take away from this storyline is a Roman Reigns absence. I think a Roman Reigns absence would not only benefit um, the storyline, it would benefit Roman Reigns because had he gotten kayfabe fired on Raw after the attack at TLC, they, let's let's face it, the IWC was at a point after TLC where they were kind of Le le they were left wanting more from Roman Reigns. So an absence for him after a performance like that where they wanted more would have made uh, his absence, They would it would have made his absence make the heart grow fonder. So I think that would have really benefited this storyline, but the way they went about it tonight on Raw is also a pretty good way to do it, and I'll get into that in a little bit. But... Uh, again, randomly, Sheamus decides to put up his championship on the line, and then um, Vince McMahon threatens to not make it so until uh, Roman Reigns hits him with, uh, oh, that's right, he told him his grapefruits were shriveled up prunes now. I uh, I thought he hit him with like the greatest insult of all time. What are you, scared? So that sets up Roman Reigns versus Sheamus for the WWE World Heavyweight Championship later tonight. All right. So, the Wyatt family versus the Dudley Boys, Tommy Dreamer, and Rhino in Philadelphia in an Extreme Rules match. Why wasn't this put on TLC? I understand you wanted to save the Extreme Rules thing probably for Philadelphia since they're ECW hardcore guys. Guys, we love the crisp in-ring work of the Dudley Boys. 
And uh, it's, I guess, understandable since this episode was kind of a be-all, end-all type of episode and kind of, uh, you know, they wanted to make it feel really special, like unforgettable. This really added to it. This was much better than their match at TLC. It didn't feel as, it didn't feel as clustery. They got into the crowd. They did a lot more creative type of things. And again, they put the Wyatt family over. One thing I was surprised to see was that Rhino was the jobber. I expected Tommy Dreamer to be the jobber since he's been a jobber for damn near the better part of 15 years now. So it was surprising to see that Tommy Dreamer hasn't jobbed out yet. Anyway, again, the, the question now is what the hell does the Wyatt family do next? And I'm tired of reading the threads and seeing, oh, Daniel Bryan will be back. You know, Bryan comes back. He's going to win the Rumble. He's going to feud with the Wyatts and all this good stuff. It's like, guys, at what point? I, I like Daniel Bryan, but at what point do we just let it go and decide, you know what, Daniel Bryan might not come back. So Lord knows what the hell is going to happen with Daniel Bryan now. Or, I mean, the Wyatt family. Daniel Bryan's probably going to retire, unfortunately. So, uh... Anyway, uh, for some reason, they cut my stream of Raw into an episode of Superstars where it was uh, Rusev and Alberto Del Rio versus Jack Thwagger and Ryback. This was definitely, uh, you know, I don't understand why they why they threw in this match from Superstars. I'm guessing they needed some filler. Um, you know, it didn't say anything about it saying uh, last night on Superstars or anything like that, but this was definitely a Superstars match right here. Um the the League of Nations wins. I don't think anybody really cares. They're not really being booked well, if at all. I mean, the only thing that kind of kept this interesting was the Ryback. I think uh, the Gayback would definitely. I think I. Uh, you know what? I I I I I should not be nice about this anymore. The Gayback should have been the League of Nations. All right. The Gayback should have been the Money in the Bank winner to begin with, and he should have formed his own League of Nations where his dick is black, his head is white, and his body is Mexican because it just doesn't stop. Because that on its own, in my personal humble opinion, and you know, when someone forms an opinion, you just can't argue with it because it's my opinion, that would have been better than the League of Nations right now. Because what's stupid about the League of Nations is their strongest mic worker is Wade Barrett, and he never gets to talk on the microphone. Alright, so another thing I wanted to touch on before I got to the Divas and then the main event. Uh, this whole thing with Neville and the Miz is weird. It's dumb. They're trying they're they're literally trying to tell us that Neville is the next Daniel Bryan, which in what fucking world is Neville the next Daniel Bryan? Because the only close thing that I think they have related to each other is Daniel Bryan has a big beard. Neville has big ears. And that rhymes. That's about as close as a connection as I can make to the two. They're both indie guys, but, I mean, one's from England, the other's from Aberdeen, Washington. And it's just, I don't understand what the hell. Do they really believe, this is what I want to know, if they really believe that Neville is going to be the next Daniel Bryan. Because if they think that, I'm afraid I've got some bad news. But I will give them credit. They at least tried to make some sense out of it. And it could be interesting if they do this correctly. But I don't know if they're hoping to get like the Damien Mizdow type of reaction to Neville. But if done right, I think this could do something for Neville. Because let's face it, what the hell else is Neville going to do to make himself to become charismatic, to become a charismatic enigma, if you will. All right, so up next was Brie Bella and Alicia Fox versus Charlotte and Becky Lynch. Now, over the past couple of weeks, we've gotten this sort of, it seems like a slow, methodical heel turn for Charlotte. They haven't really gone all the way with it yet. I don't know anyone that would go all the way with Charlotte, but that's another story for another time. 
Uh, they're doing a thing where Ric Flair accompanies her to the ring all the time, and he plays his dirty tactics. You know, this is this is pretty much like the only way they can book Charlotte, really, because even when Ric Flair isn't on TV, she's fucking mentioning him every five seconds. It's like, my dad is Ric Flair. Woo! 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 Shut up already. So this is pretty much like the only thing that I guess they could do to make her interesting is have her inherit the Flair cheating the flair tactics and have rick flair be at ringside all the time and uh one thing that i like is that they're building toward a becky lynch versus charlotte match slowly slowly but surely even though it's um even though becky lynch is far from the most charismatic diva on the roster i have no problems with becky lynch having a divas title match because it is so much better than having Paige fight for the fucking Divas Championship for the millionth time. And and it's at least a thing where I can buy into the storyline. I can buy into Charlotte being a bitch that turns her back on Becky Lynch because she's selfish. Because quite frankly, I can see that happening in real life. But uh, knowing the WWE, they'll probably throw in Paige and make it a triple threat. And it'll be a... Uh, <laughs> PCB versus PCB. They love the fight, Maya. So on to the main event. Roman Reigns versus Sheamus. This match was pretty much this. I've been watching old Attitude Era episodes. This was booked pretty much like an Attitude Era match. All right. So for all those that are complaining about how uh, Roman Reigns overcame the odds and didn't sell anything. Look back at episodes from like 2000. There were episodes when The Rock would single-handedly take out DX in matches and still win his match. But you guys had no problem when The Rock did it, did you? And no, I'm not comparing The Rock and Roman Reigns just because they're cousins. Because every time someone decides to make a comparison of the two, they seem to think that I'm trying to say that Roman Reigns is the next Rock. Which is not what I'm trying to insinuate. Anyway... Roman Reigns beats up two jobbers, a 70-year-old man. Actually, make that three jobbers because Sheamus was a jobber for fucking the whole year. Except for like maybe two months out of the whole year. And, and it is booked to perfection. Because quite frankly, and, 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 and you can disagree with me on this if you want to. This might be the best title change since CM Punk won the belt in 2011 at Money in the Rye Bank. Because you think about everything that went into it. This is the same building that 11 months prior booed Roman Reigns out of the arena when he won the Royal Rumble. This same arena blew the roof off the place when Roman Reigns won the championship. Now, yes, I will take into account Daniel Bryan is arguably also up there. I think maybe his does overdo it to an extent. But that does not take away from how epic this moment was. Because it was so out of left field. It was so out of nowhere. It was unpredictable. Which is an element that the Daniel Bryan one kind of lacked. But that one had more of a special feel to it, I guess. But again, this one had a special feel to it as well. So arguably, this is one of the best, if not the best title changes since CM Punk won the belt at Money in the Bank 2011. And the beautiful thing about this is it opens up so many more possibilities. I Like I read about it, he Roman Reigns can feud with all these heels and it just it won't seem forced it won't seem irritated because he's going to he probably going to have the rematch with Sheamus at the Royal Rumble um I don't know what he's going to do at Fastlane nobody knows uh you know you have John Cena coming back uh all this good stuff Randy Orton coming back probably soon uh Seth Rollins I hear is had rehabbing well might make it back uh in time for Mania but we don't want to rush him, so hopefully he doesn't get hurt even more. Uh, you have the whole aspect, the possibility of Dean Ambrose turning heel. 
uh, potentially John Cena even turning heel if the WWE was crazy enough to do that since now they kind of have their guy in Roman Reigns that could replace John Cena. So this was just really well done. It opens up a lot of possibilities. A lot of things can happen. This Basically, this episode of Monday Night Raw was a game changer. And it's like I said in the beginning of the, re of the review. This episode of Raw is the second best pay-per-view of the year because it was booked like a pay-per-view right behind WrestleMania 31. But again, uh, I want to give a quick shout out to the Smart Busters. Uh, check those guys out. They're, they are hilarious, even to a casual guy who doesn't watch wrestling as much. These guys are super funny, and they kind of made me want to get back into get back into reviewing. Also, the excellent booking here did as well. So this is pretty much it. Anyway, this has been the other guy for the MTO review saying yada yada yada, blah blah blah. Good and. Believe that.